So uh, I have a small presentation to start on it, just to kind of get the ball rolling with our chanterelles and trumpets. And then it'll be like a typical show and tell. And hopefully I'm sure a lot of people have pictures of the stuff to uh, show off. I have observations from four or five people already that were emailed to me. But if you do have pictures that you would like to share from your own computer, put your name in the chat now and we'll get a queue going. That way we know how, to, how much uh, time to divvy up for everyone. All right, and we will definitely try to make sure we share the time with everyone and uh, not take up too much time because we want everyone to be able to share. And finally, if somebody could volunteer to type the names into the chat so we can see the names in writing. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen and All right, can you guys see my PowerPoint? Yes, I can't hear anyone. Okay, I see heads, I see heads nodding, so I, we'll say we're good. Okay, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So chanterelles and trumpets, that's where we're at tonight. So I, uh, oops, I'm sorry. So I looked up, uh, I, I got this off of the, uh, outline of fungi, that's this study up here. It's supposed to be a really up-to-date uh, study of families, mushroom fam families right now. So they're putting chanterelles and trumpets both in Hidnaceae right now. And if you look at this, you can see that cantharellus really is the, the really the big one in here. They're, they're estimating that there's approximately 300 species of cantharellus worldwide right now. And if you look down here at Craterellus, you'll see they're estimating right now about 80 species worldwide. And if you look at some of the other things in here, I thought this was interesting. You know, of course, Hiddenum is in here. So that's all of our hedgehogs. But then there's some other weird stuff in here, like Clavulina, which is a, one of the uh, coral mushrooms, Multiclavula. Those are lichenized fungi. Uh, there's Cistostrema. Those are like these hiddenoid oftentimes crusty things. So it's a big family with a lot of different things in here, but you can see the chanterelles and the trumpets really take up a big, big part of it. So when we talk about chanterelles, this is generally what we're talking about. This is a really basic description of chanterelles. They're, gen they're as far as we know, they're uh, all mycorrhizal, meaning they live in a partnership with some sort of tree or shrub or something like that. And they're always terrestrial. So they're always found on the ground. <laughs> And when we look, look at them, under, on the underside of them, they're usually smooth, wrinkled, or covered with some kind of thick, blunt edge decurrent gills. Sometimes people call these false gills. And I think you could probably, I think people will argue about that all night long about whether false gill or true gill is the right word for it, but that's not really our discussion tonight. Um, but if you look at this one here, this is an unknown species that I find here in Philadelphia. I have yet to put a name on it. Uh, but if you look at these, this underside, this hymenial surface, see how blunt they are? Like very, uh, not like a, a regular mushroom gill that tends to be more knife edge, but it's really thick and they're decurrent, meaning they're running down the stem. Usually they're orange or yellow, and some of them have like a fruity odor, often compared to apricots, and most of them are good edibles. So the New Jersey Club. Uh, this is the 2019 species list. We're reporting nine different species in New Jersey right now. So these nine species that are over here are the ones that we are uh, have reported over the past roughly 40 years. Now, that number could go up or down. You remember there's about 300 species estimated worldwide right now. So I would actually think that we probably have a few more than nine in New Jersey. If you look the first name on here, the Cybarius group, so we know now that Cybarius, which I, I'm pretty positive is the type species for Cantharellus, that's a European mushroom. So we know that we don't actually have that mushroom here in North America, but we do have a lot of stuff that looks an awful lot like it. So, but we don't have names for it. So right now, currently, when we can't find a name for it, we're kind of calling it a Cybarius group. So we're acknowledging that it's not truly Cybarius, but it's something very similar to it. And then we have all these other ones in here, Cinebrinus, Flavus, blah, blah, blah. This one down here, Tenuothrix, that's one that was named kind of recently. And that is one of the ones that used to be called Cybarius, that we would call, regularly call Cybarius. And um, just a couple of years ago, somebody put this name, Bart Buell put this name to it. 
And um, so they are starting to sort out these North American chanterelles and give us names. Uh, these are a couple common ones that we see, and we're gonna see a lot more pictures of all of these. So I'm not gonna dwell too long on these. Later, Lateritis, the smooth one, and Cinnabarinus. Those are probably the two most common ones. Excuse me. Those are the two most common ones that we see like really regularly. Um, and I threw this picture in here. This is not on the New Jersey list, Apolachiensis. Um, but this photograph was taken at NEF, the NEF that NJMA hosted at Lock Haven uh, in 2019. And those are pretty common one in Pennsylvania. And I would be surprised if this didn't exist in Northern New Jersey up there where like the mountains cross Northwestern New Jersey. Um, I bet this does probably exist up there. Some of the lookalikes. So people love to eat chanterelles, right? So uh, people are particularly concerned about the lookalikes of chanterelles since it's such a popular edible. So this is the one that people call the false chanterelle, Hygrophoropsis orantiaca. Um, so if you look at this, I guess what throws people off initially is the fact that it's this orange terrestrial mushroom with the current gills. If you look at this, you can see the gills are like running down the stem. Um, these are just photographs off of Wikipedia. Uh, one of the th things that really gives us away is if you look at the gills a little more closely, you see that they're really kind of knife edged and they're actually a different type of tissue. So that's, I guess that's where people get the idea or get the name as a true gill. Like this is actually, if you broke this in half, you can see a very distinct separation of tissue between the gill and the actual mushroom. Ophelotus alludens, this, this is a jack-o'-lantern. This is the one that people often confuse with chanterelles. Again, they're orange. They have these decurrent gills. Um, and these are actually, can be found pretty abundantly. Uh, one of the, the key things on here, again, this knife edged gill, when you look at it is, uh, one of some of the other things that really give it away is the fact that it grows in these really intense clusters like this. Like sometimes we'll find chanterelles in small clusters, like three or four fruiting bodies together. In fact, I think that may be the uh, a distinction for a couple of species that they end to cluster together, but they generally don't cluster together in really intense groups like that. And if you look down here, you can see that these are all growing around a tree. These are actually growing on the roots of this tree. The buttress roots that are coming out. Chanterelles grow on the ground in the soil. These things, these jack-o'-lanterns are growing on wood. Even the ones that are a couple of feet from the tree, they look like they're in the soil. They're still growing on buried wood. If you dug down in there, you would find that they're attached to the roots of those trees. And these actually really are poisonous. That last one, the false chanterelle, um, it's not really clear whether they're you know, edible or poisonous. Uh, these things definitely are poisonous. They'll make you sick. They'll give you a, a really bad stomach ache if you eat them. And then these guys, uh, gonfoid mushrooms. So this is this kind of a group, um, kind of generically called the gonfoid mushrooms, Turbinellus flacocus and Gonfus clavatus. Both of these are found in New Jersey. And um, I think at one time they were both thought to be related to chanterelles. I don't think that's the case anymore. I think they're, they've been moved out of this family, but they're both, uh, they both have these kind of decurrent looking gill-like ridges on them. So those are kind of the general, in a broad sense, the generally the lookalikes of chanterelles. There's a few other ones in New Jersey that you could get them mixed up with if you weren't paying particular attention to, but um, these are the big ones that usually are considered the lookalikes. Now, genus Craterellus, these are the ones that we're calling trumpets. So these are very closely related to chanterelles. They're in the same family, the hidden ACA family. Uh, again, these are mycorrhizal and terrestrial. So we're finding them on the ground. And the undersides are actually pretty similar in the sense that they're generally smooth, wrinkled, or covered with these thick, blunt edged, decurrent gills. So they're running down the stem. Usually these guys are trumpet or funnel shaped with hollow stems. I know at one time that the hollow stems was considered a, uh, a key mark uh, tra trait of craterellus. And I think that may still be true, although. I wouldn't 100% quote me on that because these, these things keep getting moved back and forth. Craterellus and Cantharellus, they keep getting swapped back and forth between the two uh, genera. Many of them are black and gray, like this one here. Others are orange to yellow and they're often fragrant. And most of these are really good edibles too. These are the ones that actually dry pretty well. You know, these black trumpets, they dry pretty well, where it seems in my personal experience, the uh, most of the chanterelles do not dry very well. 
So if you recall that study, that original study that I quoted said there's about 80 of these worldwide. NJMA is reporting 10 species of these. So these are the 10 species, this list here, that the New Jersey Club has identified over the past 40 years. And some of them have just recently been identified. I think some of these names are actually pretty new, a few of them. Okay, so a couple just quick species um, for the Craterellus, the Craterellus phallus and Craterellus ignicolor. These are the two really common ones that I often find. Uh, so this, both of these are good edibles. Um, both of these are commonly collected in the New Jersey area. The only lookalike for these that I can, could even think of is this one here, which is found in New Jersey, Polyozelus multiplex which again, I think was once in the same family. I think it may have been moved out of the family, but this is considered edible too. People, people, some people consider this a really good edible. I think they collect them out West commercially sometimes. They call them the blue chanterelle. Um, but that's the only lookalike I could really think of for a black trumpet. As far as references go, there's not a whole lot of really good references for either of these chanterelles or trumpets. Most of these, most guidebooks have a few common ones in there, but this is a really, a lot of this is really uncharted territory, especially in North America, where we're really currently just working on sorting these out. Mushroom Expert has a pretty good article on chanterelles and trumpets. It's about six years ago, so it's not 100% up to date anymore, um, but it's worth reading. Michael Quebec, they have a dozen or 15 cantharellus species, I think, listed on there. Um, some of those are probably not relevant to our area. They're a little more northern, but it's worth looking at and you can look on there. And then any papers by Bart Buick. So if you really want to dig in deep and really try to understand chanterelles in particular, Bart Buick is the guy that's really doing the big studies right now. And he's the one who's been really actively naming them. He's leading these studies as far as I know. Um, this book here, The Field Guide to Mushrooms of the Carolinas, out of all the books that I have, this is probably the one with the most diverse names in there, um, the different names that are in there for different species. Uh, so that's the one I would look at first. Um, these are all kind of runner up references. These are all good books. They're all worth putting on your, in your you know, book collection for your mushroom identification. Um, and, but probably I think roughly in this order, the Southeastern book, then the Northeastern book, then the Appalachian Mount Mushrooms book, they all have a handful of chanterelles, at least a couple of the lesser common ones in there. And then the trick with these is you can't just look at the pictures and read the descriptions, but you have to read the notes section. So for every chanterelle species that's in here, in the notes section, they'll reference at least you know one or two other ones that are not pictured in the book, but at least you'll get a different name and a brief description and it'll give you a little something else to look at. So that is what I dug up on chanterelles this week. And I would like to uh, put this out there, or I would like to open this up and let people start sharing with all of our chanterelle photographs. So, so, so far I see K is the first one. And I'm sure there's other people with pictures. So put your name in the chat right now and we will start doing that. Let's take a look at your picture, K. Still muted, Kay. Mute? Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. I'm not good at doing this. Let me see. Share screen. I put it I put it up there, but I don't see it. Hmm. No. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. I'm not good at doing this. Maybe go to the next person. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else in the chat yet. So I'm going to go back. I'm going to share my <laughs> screen again. And I will go uh, to my emails. Hmm.
Okay, can you guys see my, my inbox? Somebody yes. say yes? yes? Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. I can't see anybody right now. Okay, so John and Nina, I'm just going in the order that I received these emails. So would you, would you like to go first? Is John and Nina there? I saw John earlier. There we are. There you are. <laughs> he needed to unmute us. Okay, well, you took my thunder, okay? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, no, come on, you tell us more about them because I okay, glossed so, over them. Okay, the first one is the Gumpus. Uh, it's not It's not called Flacosis, it's not Gumpus anymore, it's called something else. It's called Turbinellus. Anyway, um, that actually belongs to the uh, Stinkhorn family. And uh, so that, that, that we get this in Stokes and up north. Okay. So this is more kind of a mountain mushroom, right? I've, the only time I've ever seen it is when I'm in the mountains. Yeah, Stokes, right, uh, up north Jersey. Yeah. Okay. Next. Ah, yes. This is that little thing that you mentioned, the uh, multi-clavia mu mucida. mucida. Um, and and we find it in a lot of times in Franklin Park or in very very wet areas like in in the bogs almost sometimes covered with water because it grows with the lichens on the, on very very uh, rotten wood and moss yeah you can see the lichens right. and moss here yeah. sphagnum moss yep okay next so, okay so this is the one I was actually saying that is actually thought to be lichenized right because yeah, it's, it's always with this algae. They're always together. So that's in the same family as chanterelles for anybody yeah. that. And then there, there's your black trumpet that, that we find. We find that in pine barrens. We find it everywhere in New Jersey. Um, north, south, east, west. <laughs> <laughs> that's the typical. Do we know what kind of uh, black trumpet that is? Well, that's a phallic, so I think I did the spore print on that one. I think it was pink. But uh, yeah, they, they, a lot of them look sort of almost the same. They do have different color spores. So broad, diff broad types of habitat, Nina? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it can be, it can be, uh, that was pine. It can be in the uh, uh, hardwoods. It can be, yeah, beach. A lot of times they like to tuck themselves along, like you see a, lo a log along um, that's fallen down. And, and a lot of times they'll tuck themselves right on the side of the log. Hmm. But I, I've found with those things too, a lot of times you'll be standing in a patch of them without <laughs> even seeing them because they blend in so well. And you'll see one and focus on that and all of a sudden the other ones will all pop into focus. Right. Now this is this is that uh, poly. Now this was yeah this was this was recorded in New Jersey in Homedale, but I don't think that's what it was. I think it was the, um, the another mushroom because this is this is this has got out west, and it's it's really it's really tight. It's a, a bunch together. It's not like separate little pieces. Polyzero. So it shows it on. I think the next one shows the bottom of it. Yeah, that's the bottom. Yeah, that shows the bottom. See, it's, it's all joined. It's it, it's uh, it's sort of joined together. They're not all. I mean, it certainly looks like it. Yeah. Right. That that belongs in the um in the Telephra family. Mm. But I don't think we got Sixth it here. John and this, what? John says there are six species. Of this oh, one. is there six species? Oh, shoot. <laughs> now this this one looks very much like the other one, but this is this is a um um a gumpus again, a gumpus uh, clavatus. 
Uh, this is the one you showed, uh, Luke. Mm -hmm. This is from New Jersey. So I think that's that's. Uh, I think that's all I had. Yeah. Yeah, you had another one here that said not. Oh, that's the. Was oh yeah, this is the thing we found in Homedale, and this is this was put as a as the uh, poly um, the the poly uh, cellos, cellos, but I you know I'm sure it's not, and I don't know what it is. But it was growing, it was growing sort of clumped together, but it's it's not it's not your normal um, black trumpet. I don't know what the heck it is. Enough. So, so how would Enough. you go go about trying to decide uh, if if you come across it, you would make a spore print and then look that yeah. up. You dry it and give it and, and put it in her herbarium for somebody else to figure out. Okay. <laughs> Nina. Yeah. I think this one is the one that is called Graterellus uh, cinereus. You think? And yeah, and there is like a debate in if it is Cinereus or Venosus. Okay. I find it, we found it in Helmeta Park and I found this one all the time in Smithville. Okay. Exactly what you're showing. Mm -hmm. right. I think we decided at um, Thompson Park that it was Venosus because of the, the webbing. But I find that in Smithville too, down in that little gully, Maricel, that seems. Yeah, it was the when we were in Helmeta like two or three years ago and I was walking by myself and I ended in a patch that has beech trees and grass and I almost I almost screamed because it was exactly the same habitat as I have in Smithville yeah where the same kind of thing grows and it's really dense I mean there was a ton uh -huh. of it was incredible yeah. and like swampy too I it think we ended up on I, I have a tag of it and I think we labeled it as um, venosis Oh, okay, it's it between like, the two names because like there was a discussion with Igor too. Yeah. In I Motion Observer. Yeah. I'm going to write it on the chat. That's a good edible though. I mean, oh, it's delicious. It, I'm, I'm collected and it dries very quick. And then you put it on fry on the on scramble eggs. Oof, the flavor is really good. Yeah, it tastes a lot like black trumpets, the regular phallics. I don't know what's the flavor, but it's really good. <laughs> Graterellus cinereus or venosus. Okay, Nina, I wrote it there. Nina, you were quick to say that this wasn't the usual black trumpet. What features made you able to say that, if you could articulate? Um, well, it was clumped together. Okay. Usually the black trumpets are sort of separate. You might find one, uh, you know, one or two that are, that are joined together, but not a whole clump of them. Okay. And um, also, there's much more of a stem on these things. Uh, the black trumpets are sort of grayer, and and the stem, yeah, the stem isn't as smooth mm -hmm. and as plus, well defined. Plus, the veins are absent on the trumpets. And these ones are marked, and they are kind of grayish, ashy mm -hmm. color. The rest of the fruiting body is dark, and the the hymenial, the fertile part is lighter grayish almost like yeah like ashes thank you so anyway i just thought it was interesting that you know this had been this had been i remember being there and this was labeled the the other thing and then then i went back and looked at it and said no it's not that okay it's something else <laughs> so sometimes that when you you picking things and at the time you don't know but then later on you go back and say oh well no i don't think it's that <laughs> yeah cool uh -huh. all right so thank you john and nina yeah all right penny I receive your stuff next. Okay, so I just guessed what these were. I wasn't really sure. I guess this is a Siberius uh, family. Yeah, I would say. Siberius group, as you said. Right. 
And the, these were uh, in upstate New York. Hmm. So uh, would I gain anything by um, <clears throat> doing a spore print on trying to decide uh, what what else I can uh, narrow these down or, or not? You, you know, I always read with chanterelles. They say spore prints are really important with chanterelles because it, a lot of the species separation has a lot to do with like the subtle coloration of the spore prints. I read that, like Michael Quo talks about that. I think I read in some of those Bart Buick papers that he's often very descriptive about the, about the spore print colors. I've yet to be able to put that into practical knowledge, practical use. So that would be to just make the spore print and don't put any uh, dye on it. Correct. You would. Okay. You would put this. Oh yeah, that's right. I'm thinking of I'm thinking of the microscopic. So just make a spore print and then mm -hmm. look at that. Okay. Yep. Okay. So yes, yeah, uh, Cybarius group, you know, or thing that we used to call Cybarius. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to put a name on a lot of these. But it's definitely a, a good good one to eat. Yeah. I was going to put my picture of the, the big colander full of them. One year I was very successful, but I, I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are um, craterellas, I guess. And um, I forgot what I put. I guess lut lutes. Lutes. Yeah, you have cantharellus lutescens. Do you think that's correct? I, I just guessed by what they looked like. I don't know. Anybody have a, an opinion on that? They have like the orange stalk and the, the brownish cap, and that's why I, with the brownish gills, lighter, a little lighter. Yeah, they, I'm, I'm looking at pictures on my phone of lutescens on the internet. They look pretty similar. Okay. Seems like the stipes are kind of flattened. Is that true? I don't know. Uh, yeah, a lot of times on these these types, the yeah the, the stipe is kind of flattened out and often hollow. And I guess a lot of times they call them uh, winter chanterelles uh, because they're later in the season. Is that correct? I've heard that being called. Yeah, I've definitely heard that. Yeah. Winter chanterelles. And I, I find these in a hemlock woods with a, a, a lot of moss in, in a wet spot in the woods where there's like a spring. I've seen them in markets called yellowfoots too. Oh, okay. Um, it's a yellowfoot. Could you go back a picture or two? It seemed that. Oh, I'm sorry. The one in the egg crate, but on the lower right, that one, mm -hmm. that looks very different. The one on the very lower right, it looks like it has yeah. a, a right. separation. You're right. That one and the and the one next to it looks mm -hmm. different too. Yeah, you're right. These Maybe two. those are different. Yeah, the, the gill structure, the hymenial surface looks a lot more developed than those. Oh, yeah. Well, they were in the same area, but you're right. They, I didn't, uh, maybe, I don't know. Maybe that one's more yellow foot. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where to, I, I, I'd never have made a spore print from a, a, a chanterella or a craterellus. Do any of them have a, a distinction between the gill or non-gill area and the stipe? like that one on the lower right? So I'm looking in one of the Bisset books. I mean, there's another one called Cantharellus in Funda biliformis. Or minor, what about minor? Yeah, or tube, there's another one called tubiformis. That's another name for yellowfoot. And it looks a lot like that. 
much more than any of the uh, lutescence. Yeah, I think miners more one solid color. Yeah. Uh, chanterelle orangish. Look at um, Craterellus tubiformis and see what you think for the these on the bottom. All right, well, you're definitely in the right ballpark, Penny. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'll, I'll continue to <laughs> look at these. You know, these are hard, harder than you think, right? Yeah, definitely. Chanterelles. Yeah. Okay, what else did you have? I had one that I thought was two before. Oh, yeah, you did. Okay, uh, well, well, these well, are, I didn't know if these were Chanterelles minor or not. Uh, now, minor, minor is usually really, um, I have a picture of one, actually. The stem is very thin. Yes, very delicate. Yeah, very delicate, yeah. No, no, oh, okay. these look too fat. What, and so what about these here? They're just small ones? Yeah, little babies. Okay. I find a lot of times these babies will start and then they, they stunt and won't grow anymore because it stops raining. Oh, I see. Or maybe they would have grown. They might have grown more. Yeah, these are these are. If so, I'm, I'm looking at them. If you want to focus, but it looks like yeah. you can pretty much see that it's got that decurrent stipe there. Oops. This one's a little more obvious. You can see. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you, you can almost tell by the texture too. These are like heavy, like dense little things. Yeah. Okay, then this one you called tubiformis. Yeah. So that one, I guess, is more similar to the one that you noticed in the in the egg crate that's got a distinctive yellow uh, stipe and then the grayish brown cap with a more of a distinction between the, as somebody said, of the gill, gill surface and the, and the cap and the, and the stipe. So maybe more tubiformis. Let's see, I'm looking in Walt Sturgeon's book right now. If his picture they are, of a They were all growing in that same area though. The, these and the, and the um, possible lutescens. Yeah, that looks like you're in the very right ballpark for that. I'm looking at a photograph in uh, the Appalachian Mushrooms book of Hugh Aformis. So he doesn't have a description in there. He only has a photograph in there, but. But that looks about right. Lauren just said that uh, Tuba Formis is only in Europe. So maybe we. This will be well, that 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 could be very possible. That's happening with a lot of these chanterelle species that we have a name that's been being used for a long time and then it's getting yanked out of you know use here because the DNA on it is separating it out. So that's yeah. quite possible. Yeah. <clears throat> I guess we need to include some of these in our microflora project. Send them away. You know, you, you, you know, I wanted to, but um, the microflora, now known as fundus, they um, they don't want chanterelles. Well, it's not that they don't want them. Um, they the sequencing that they're doing is not relevant for chanterelles. Uh, I know because <laughs> I have some. Anybody we can send them to Luke? I think Michael Koo had uh, somebody didn't he that we could send sa I'm, samples to. I'm actually uh, maybe I don't know. I'm actually. I actually have everything I need now to do the uh, extractions at my house. Oh, so it's um, in the view. Well, and I have then to get, how do you how do you do the sequencing then? Don't yeah, you, you have need send, like a fancy machine to do that? So the what you have to do is you have to do an extraction of the DNA, an extraction and an amplification of the DNA first, and that can be done in, in, in home. So a lot of people are doing that in their house. And that's what I was just referring to. I'm able to do that at my house now. I'm not good at it yet, but I can, I have the equipment and I'm learning how to do it. And then you send the DNA off to a lab 
and you pay about five bucks to get it sequenced. Wow. But unfortunately, the really common gene that uh, people sequence, the ITS gene, the so-called barcode gene, has fallen out of favor for chanterelles. So if you read the uh, the papers, the modern papers on chanterelles, the ones that have come out in just the past couple of years, they're using different genes. So that requires you know a little bit of different work, but it's still possible to do. But like the big fundus project, they're only working on one gene at a time. So, so what's, a, what's the cost of the of the lab work? Uh, about five dollars. That's it. Yeah. Oh. Once wow. you once you do all the other work yourself, as long as you do the other work yourself. Sigrid Jacob has um, some nice YouTube videos about that whole extraction yeah. process. Yes. She's been very helpful to me. Yeah. And, and now that I actually have the equipment in hand, she's probably going to be hearing a lot more from me. <laughs> so Luke, next season, can we bring these to you and let's uh, you get them, some of the more unusual ones? Maybe, because I'm definitely very interested in learning more about these chanterelles. Cool. So this is your last one, Penny. Yes. So this is uh, full, also found in the same area, only one or two of them. And uh, I did know, I mean, the, the um, folds are more distinctive than, than uh, cornucopioides. So mm -hmm. I thought I, I didn't know where else to go. I just, the only book that I have has fet fetidus as one possibility, but. What's the name again? F-O-E-T-I-D-U-S. Oh, okay. Like, did it smell? Oh, I have to look in my notebook and see. I think it's spelled fruity, yes. Compare but, it with the um, Crateralis venosus or the Crateralis cinereus. Yeah, that's okay. what those two. Okay. That's what I'm thinking too. I'm looking at venosus right now and they look pretty darn similar from the mushroom observer oh. pictures I'm looking at. No, they don't look similar. I'm looking at an awful lot of pictures on Mushroom Observer and it looks pretty darn similar. Oh. What, do you, what do you think, Marisol? No, I never saw anything like that. It's really different. And I, the, I find these cinereos or venosos all the time. It, many of them, many, many. And they don't have this brownish color. They got a, a dark gray color on the caps and stem and the ashy color on the veins. In my opinion, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see the different color on the cap and the veins in this picture that it is sort of grayer veins, but. I may be wrong, but it doesn't look like the same to me, but looks <laughs> said to me. Same to me, yourself. I see oh. very similar ones. <laughs> can you, guys, if I switch over to Mushroom Observer, do you guys see me switching like that? Yeah. yeah. You see yeah. this? So look at, um. I mean, again, this is all Mushroom Observer. You have to take it with a grain of salt. Everything you say, it's not like it's a guarantee that it's what this is. But here's a craterellus. I don't know who the guy who actually put it on there, Mike Hopping, but uh, Herbert Baker, uh, he added to it. And he's a pretty reputable guy. He's a Hebaluma guy. Hey, Luke, what, Mike Hopping is the author on the mushrooms of the Carolinas along with the Bissettes. Oh, okay. So, so he's, he's a pretty, pretty good guy. So here's his picture of one. All right. So this one's a lot lighter in color than some of the other ones that I'm looking at, we say. And there's hers. There's Penny's. I'd say that looks really similar. Yeah, I've always been taught, you know, you know, Patricia McNaught, she was one of the first people to really teach me a lot about mushrooms. And I remember she used to always tell me not to get too caught up in the color because the color is really variable. Ver colors are, you know, there's so much that goes into that with environmental factors that, um, you know, it's important, but it's not, you know, the be all end all. So, so that's a possibility. Yeah. yeah. Well, great. That's that's very um, helpful. Mm -hmm. So that's a good way, you know, 
if you're curious about these, when you're if you have a name to start with, you know, put Craterella spinosis in your in your uh, search engine and search it and go to places or go right to Mushroom Observer. Um, you know, that's one thing I like about Mushroom, you know, Mushroom Observer and both and INAT too. If you learn INAT, is once you get to know some of these names, like I know who Herbert Baker is, right? Um, and then obviously uh, Liz knows who Mike Hopping is. So these are some people that are, uh, you know, pretty reputable. Great. All right. All right, let me get back to this. So did you have any more, Penny? I think that was it. I sent you, did I send you five emails, right? Yep, yep, I think that okay. was the last one. Yeah. Okay, Dave is not here yet. So let's skip over him and then go to Liz. I have another one that I don't know what it is. I could send you if you run out of time. Okay, sounds great. Okay, there it is. I'm right here, yep. All right. Okay, and this is whatever Siberius group we're calling it. It's got the nice, the blunt gills, smell like apricots, just a beautiful little flower. And they, they grow clustered, you know, a few of them at a time. And there's other pictures of that same mushroom if you wanna see the top. Yeah, there, it was just wonderful. And it was under um, beach, a lot of beach in central New Jersey. So. I wanted to look in the Bissette's book, the new one, the Carolina book. Yeah, they're calling them. Inuex, actually. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I was saying. thinking. That's yeah, what that's was... what they're saying that, um, but I'm not sure that that's true up here. I think that Pinuex is more a southerly species. And this was in Mercer County. But maybe, again, unless you do a DNA, we're not going to know. Please. It certainly looks like the one in their book. Yes, Maricel. Do you have the one you found in Franklin Parker? I would love to see it. You know what? I don't have a picture. Oh. I don't. I don't know what happened to it. I was looking for it today. Okay. But um, it was smaller than this. It was kind of diminutive, and it had a much, much paler. Um, so nobody has a book? Probably only maybe an inch and a half tall. Oh my! And it wasn't like the laterites with the smooth. Mm -hmm. Does Emma, this one? Because we find those. One, look, sorry, sorry. Does this one grow really big? Yeah, some of them are ah, really big, like a couple of inches it? across. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. And the smell you you mentioned the smell is so delicious. Yep, beautiful. And your hands end up yellow by the time you pick them. So very fun to find. Do we find chanterelles from summer on? Somebody's asking. I'm sorry, what was that? Do we find chanterelles summer on? Oh, yeah. Summer in the fall. I find them into September sometimes. Yeah, like July through, like usually the end, the very end of June through oh, okay. into the beginning of September. The first big summer rain is usually when I start finding them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, there's really hot, hazy summer days where it's really raining a lot. We get a lot of thunderstorms. It's really, really humid out kind of gross out. That's like good chanterelle weather. <laughs> and then these are the craterellus phallics. And Lila, you can see these don't have the, um, the blunt stems that the other ones do. And as Luke said, you can be standing on a big pile of them and not really even see them. Yes. And these wow. were in oak, obviously, looking at the uh, oak leaves there. Yeah. But I've also found them in hickory and beech. It's funny because these are like these look like they're nice and fresh, but even the, even like in a fresh state like this, see how just kind of they look like old dried up leaves. They really do. The first time we ever saw them, we were in Stokes and we were hike, hiking up um, a real rocky trail, and I, we thought they were leaves. And then Kevin looks down and he goes, "Liz, look at this. This isn't a leaf." And you know, literally, we could have picked hundreds of them, but we had two little babies and <laughs> we picked a couple. <laughs> But we've never seen them like that again at Stokes, but it was pretty impressive. Very cool. Some years I think are more prolific. 
this last year was good, but the year before, um, as Penny, I think Penny said, it was just crazy. There were so many of them. Yeah. Yeah, there's a place, there's a park near my house where one year there were so many there. I just spent the entire afternoon there, just me and the kids. I just, every beach tree, I would send the kids to the beach tree and tell them to start picking. They were little too. Yeah. And uh, the kids were little and we were just loaded with, I came home with like grocery bags of them. And that, yeah. that, that's the only time I've ever seen them grow like that in that, in that particular forest. You'll, yeah. find, you'll find handfuls of them there now and then, but I guess There's the conditions- There's so much fun to clean too, aren't they, Luke? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I also put some Lateritis, I think, in there too. Oh, and these are, okay. The Sibarius we kind of already looked at. You don't have to do that one again. Okay. But you already did, so that's okay. I already did, so. And this is just, it's from a different place, but. The same, they grow in a little cluster. They so have the, the one that is them is kind of thick. They have kind of a thick skin. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. They do. In the pine barrens, because I found it in the pine barrens. Yeah, I've seen them in the pine barrens. Oh, okay. Yep. This wasn't in the pine barrens. This was in Mercer County. Mm -hmm. But again, they're What's, prolific. We get grocery look bags. At the, look at the veins towards the edge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A little like wrinkled almost. As yeah. Well. Yeah. Beautiful. And they're yeah. interconnected. Gorgeous. Oh yeah. Yeah. So that's a feature that's often in the in the books where they um where they're trying to describe some of the subtleties is they talk about this stuff right here. They call it cross veining. Whoa. So some species apparently have cross veining, and some species do not. At least according to the, like some of the guidebook authors, like the Bassettes. And were you saying that the small chanterelles have a thin uh, stipe as opposed to the, the... The minor? The minor, I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. The minor usually is a, yes, a thin stiped. But they're pretty distinct. I have a photograph of one. We'll get to it, I think, next, maybe. So... Liz? Yes. How exactly do these differentiate from the ones you showed earlier? Because they look very similar to me and I was trying to pick up on No, nope, they are both that Siberius or however you say it group. And evidently Siberius isn't found in this United States now, but we don't really know what to call it. But it's still that golden chanterelle. Both of them, both of them were just from different places. No, no, no. I, I'm not sure where, I was talking about the, the ones you just showed them. Oh, the black trumpets. Terrianus? with the, the golden ones you showed earlier before. Okay. Uh, I missed the name of it. They're, they're both Siberius. Okay. Both the ones that I've shown so far. Okay. Are you, talk, are you talking about? Yeah. The, about this the, one? Yes. Yeah. They're probably would, the same thing, right? They look Yeah, the I would consider them the same thing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. We should find these in Central Jersey? And, and they were delicious. I, I ate a lot of them this last year. <laughs> they are wonderful. And you know what, though? They Fantastic. don't dry well. And I've tried sauteing it and lightly and just freezing them. And they're OK, but they really lose something. It's a real um, ephemeral yeah, uh, apricot-y taste. Agreed. I think chanterelles are best enjoyed fresh. Yeah, they really are. So I you share know, with my friends. Yeah, you know. I've, I've heard that, too. But I've also heard that if you reconstitute them in milk or cream instead of water, you'll get a better result with the dried chanterelles. So if you have any, you could try that. That's interesting. I've never heard that. You know, one thing I have done with chanterelles that works reasonably well is um, I've taken them in a very carefully poached them in clarified butter and then just put the entire th thing of butter into the fridge with the chanterelles still in them. Mm. And it's kind of like a, uh, like a duck confit. And then you can dig the chanterelles out of there over the winter. And then, the, of course, the butter is usable, too. Nice. But honestly, then, chanterelles are so abundant and, and they last for so long in a good season. I can usually keep eating them fresh until I'm tired of them. And then <laughs> I don't even care about having any of them saved. Well, I, you posted that one recipe with um, a succotash that you do with zucchini and chanterelles. Oh, yeah. That's delicious. That's one of my favorite salads in the summer. Oh, oh I, I didn't see that, but uh, is yeah. it a is it a cold salad or or yeah. a room yeah. temperature? Okay. 
it's fact, in, you know, I'll try to remember, I'll dig up, because I don't have any recipes, because this is really more of a taxonomy thing tonight, but I'll try to find that recipe and maybe we can get it posted somewhere. It was in our newsletter a yeah. while ago. That's where I have it from, but it's not on our website. Okay. But I, I love that recipe. And then this, I'm sorry, the picture is crooked, but this is what we found at Thompson Park. And I didn't find it, but... Um, it was identified as venosis, and you can see the the veins mm -hmm. on the bottom. Yeah, very thick, like. Yeah, and a little velvety. You know, it's there. It was a pretty thing, and it smelled wonderful. It really did have a very lovely black trumpety smell. So you can see that there is a little uh, bit of the brown there. And these were older looking. All right, so we feel like these are venosis. And then I keep talking, but if somebody else has other ones, there's um, the Cinnabarinus too, that they're fun to find. Pretty little red things. Yeah, I love these things. <laughs> yeah. I don't feel like they have much flavor, but they look really pretty in dishes. They are very pretty in dishes. We can collect them. Very pretty in, in salads. Oh. I know one of my friends that likes martinis puts them in martinis. I'm not a martini person, but well, it looks very that's, elegant. That's an interest. Would you cook it first before you put it in a salad or a martini? No, they're so little. And you're not eating a ton of them. I think so if you were going to eat. You can eat them without. Uh, cooking them? Probably not supposed to, but nothing ever happened. <laughs> I put them in you're, salads. <laughs> yeah, you're probably not supposed to, but you know what, actually, chanterelles are one of the ones that people do often kind of dabble with uncooked. You're not supposed to cook any, eat, you're not supposed to eat any wild mushroom raw. That's the official stance oh. on it, but some people do dabble with chanterelles a little bit on the raw side or the undercooked side. Look. Yes? How do you deal with the sand? I stopped collecting them because it's a pain in the neck. Oh, I live I, in Pennsylvania. That's how. You don't have sand. We have clay. Oh. <laughs> so I don't take the ones from Franklin Park. Oh. They're horrible. They're from Franklin. But you can never get places, that out. Oh. In many places that I find them, they, they're covered with sand because they are like a, yeah. a, on the edges where mm -hmm. there is most and sand. So they are all splashed with sand. Horrible. Yeah. So yeah. you know what? That's an interesting point since we're talking about that. Um, See these, see all the dirt that's underneath of them? So what happens a lot of times with chanterelles is they grow. And chanterelles actually last. Hey, look, there's little um, jelly babies in here too. Oh, yes, Leotia. <laughs> yeah, look at those. I didn't see <laughs> that. Hey, that's so cool. But, but what happens, because chanterelles actually persist for a good while. You know, once they grow up out of the ground, they'll stay there for days at a time. And then usually they're like, in, in, in where I live at in the deciduous area, they're pretty clean when they first come up, but mm. when it rains again, the rain splatters yeah. the dirt underneath. It's like, see these ones on the left, the underside of them? Mm -hmm. See how dirty they are? Yep. That, that's from rain splattering, yeah. like muck back up underneath of them. And to be honest with you, if it has too much muck under there, I don't even bother with them. Oh, you know, oh I just oh, wait. I try, splash with sand. <laughs> yeah, I, I just try to, I try to go somewhere where maybe there's more leaf cover and there's less dirt. Okay. Or maybe I just pass over them. I usually squeeze them too. Not so much these, but the Laterites and the Sibarius ones. And if they're spongy, you know they're going to have wormholes. And I, I usually don't pick those either. Not even worth it. Luke? Yes? This is Igor. Hi, Igor. Um, I joined recently. I missed most of this hour. Um, I don't know if this was discussed at, the, uh, um, at this meeting before I joined, but there's been a lot of papers on chanterelles recently in the last maybe five, six years. And... Uh, I don't know if any of you read those papers, but a lot of species have been, have been discovered, including the ones from the Cinnabarinus group. So I don't even know if we should call these Cinnabarinus. Yeah, you know, I was actually going to bring that up shortly, as soon as this came up. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so uh, there's there's one called um, Coralinus. Correct, yes. And there's another one called Texinus, Texan, uh, Texi Texas, Texensis. Yes. Right, Texensis, yes. Um, and according, I, from what I read, you can only tell them only microscopically and genetically. Correct. Yeah, that's what the paper said. 
But as far as the yellow ones are concerned, I mean, they've been probably described over a dozen species easily in the last, you know, five, six years. I know that uh, uh, Tom Volk, um, he published a paper wherein they described three species, as, you know, found basically within 15 or 20 yard radius from each other. And uh, Phasmatis, I think, was one of them. I forget. I forget the, the, the paper, what it was called and when it was published. But, you know, I think when we ID mushrooms, you know, like that, we should have access to the literature because I believe that field guys are no longer the go to reference on the subject. Mm -hmm. You know, the same thing about other guild mushrooms like Trichalomas and Cortinarius. Sure. Yeah, we've been kind of dabbling in that all night, like saying that, like, you know, we can say these are chanterelles, but we just can't put good names on a lot of these things. Yeah, I mean, so. uh, we could probably even, well, <laughs> I just remembered Micah 4 doesn't sequence ch chanterelles. So <laughs> yeah, we were just talking about that too. <laughs> yeah, we, we don't have the prime, they don't have the primers to, to do the sequencing. I, I should ask Linus if that's true, you know, because I presumed these are universal primers for sequencing. They're universal because they work for all fungi. So I, ha I have no idea why chanterelles are so special. You know, the, the, um, the latest like Bart Buick papers I've been reading, yeah, it's like four or five genes, and none of them are the ITS genes that they're they've been using. If I recall correctly. Yeah, but that's for phylogeny. What Mike, what Fundus was saying that you know that I mean they sequence they presumably they sequence other genes, but what they do for citizen scientists they just sequence ITS. In my understanding, after I, I read their their website, was that they don't sequence even ITS for chanterelles because the primers are because universal primers don't work. Yeah, so I have to reread that statement again, but they basically said, do not send us any chanterelles. Right. I'll be interested in hearing what Linus has to say about that too. I'll ask him, I'll email yeah. him tonight. That'd be good. Bob just posted too a link to Tom Volk's study. So oh, cool. I'm gonna look that up. Thank you, Bob, for doing that. Y yeah, some of these papers, I think the one that Luke mentioned uh, with the uh, Cinnabarinus group and, and Tom Volk's, they should be available to the public. If you go to ResearchGate or even try to Google, you know, something like chanterelle phylogeny, those things should come up. And there might be another one or two that are probably also free of charge. You know, you can dig them up online. So here's one that we always call uh, Cantorellus lateradius. But again, you know, I just read somewhere that there's at least one or two other species that are very similar. Yes, it's a species group. But go ahead, uh, Liz, these are your pictures. What well, name do you say? I, I somehow lost you. I clicked on Bob's link and I lost uh, the picture, but I know which ones they are. Those are lateriduses. Yeah. And um, they're go, wonderful. Marcel. And they're much better when you pick them before they've really fully expanded. Once they get bigger, they get buggy really quick because of course it's in really humid summer. I'm confused. Are those the same that you showed before that is made like of peach? Same thing? Or no. no. <laughs> we have not seen these except for that little blip I did in the beginning. These are the smooth chanterelles. Oh. See how smooth they are underneath? Yeah. What's the name? Lateritius. Oh, lateritius. Okay. This, this is also, in my experience, this is the most common of the yellow chanterelles that you find in mm -hmm. the greater Philadelphia area. I'm sorry to insist. What's the name for the other yellow? We don't have a name for it. Ah, ah, ah. Okay. We, we're calling it Siberius Group. When I find Artist it, S L Sensulato. <laughs> yes. Okay. Siberius, and this is Lateritus. Okay. So everybody, see that? See how smooth these are? So mm. everyone that we've looked at so far has had really distinct ridges underneath them. Wow. Them. And even this species, when it gets a little bit older, it'll still have some ridges. In like what habitat? You could. These are the ones that I always find in the oak beach forest. Oh, yeah. Okay. In, in us usually like on slopes above creeks. Okay. Like the drainage, you know, there's drainage slopes that you see coming through the forest, going down in the creeks. Those be loaded with these things. But you see, even this one, sometimes, you know, we call them the smooth, but they still get some of these hymenial ridges underneath of them. Somebody's Just, asking if they taste good. Yes. Yeah, yeah they're, they're awesome. <laughs> 
<laughs> and they're prolific. You can get a lot of them, which is great. Share them with your friends and neighbors because <laughs> they don't they don't really preserve great, but they last in the refrigerator for a while. I leave them in a paper bag. Yeah, they sure do. They're pretty hardy. I mean, they're they're firm. And if they're young, if they're young and they're, they they got some bugs, as long as they're young, they're pretty tasty. And yeah. bugs and all. And <laughs> With the bugs? Or well, the worms out. just go through them. Yeah. Now, yeah, that's a good point, Nina. You know, usually I rip these open and you see those worm holes in them, but you never actually see the insects. I think the insects are gone by then. Yeah. I think they've already pupated and flown away. And Anything too squishy, I don't take, but a couple of worm holes, oh. who worries about that, you know? Mm -hmm. All right, awesome. Thanks, Liz. Sure. All right. So I have two on here that we haven't really seen yet. This is the one we call Catherellus minor. So these are really small little things. So this whole thing is probably an inch tall and no more than an inch wide. To find them along paths. Yeah, well, those things almost almost look like sharp edge gills, though, you know. Yeah, but they're still. If you look at that, that's still, it's still flat. They're not that sharp. Thick. But they're very. You're right. Thick. Thick's a good way to say it. They're waxy. Mm -hmm. And I when you feel. And when you tear these in half, I haven't seen a, a single good photograph. You can almost kind of see it there. When you tear these in half, you don't really see a distinction between the tissue of oh. this so-called gill and the cap. They kind of just all blends together. Like solid. Yes. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, you tear like a, like a hygrosabe in half, mm -hmm. you see, you know, the distinct cap tissue and then a very distinct line and the gill starts and it looks different. Mm -hmm. These things I eat too, but they have no flavor at all. But they're pretty. They look good. In they look good in dishes. <laughs> yeah. And then the other one I have on here is this. I have never gotten a name on this thing. I've been finding it for years. I find there's a spot right near my house where I find three three different chanterelle species growing within you know, 50 feet of each other, just like Igor was referencing with Tom Volk. I find the smooth chanterelles, I find the cinnabarinus or whatever they are, and then I find these things. And these it's have- Four have a, white? Well, more of a peachy color. Ah, that was, that was, yeah, yeah, cool. See how peachy it is underneath? And they're always very distinctly this like pinkish color. There is a, a, a thing called a uh, Cantharellus persicinus, and this kind of fits it, but not exactly. Persicinus is supposed to have cross veining, but they call that the peach, the, the little peach chanterelle. You look, it looks like if you look in um, the uh, Carolina book, there's something called Velutinus. Yeah, looks you know, I have, a, I have that open too. Um, that's, that might be a possibility too. This one ends up being a little bit bigger than the one that they call persicinus. So this one has forked ridges. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're yeah. right. Yep. See, see how forking yep. they are? Multiply forking. Mm -hmm. uh, look, this one, I found something like this and it's stained red. And I noticed your stains red too. Yeah, like up yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Yep, down in there where my fingers are on it. You know what? That volutinous. Uh, Looks like it has some red staining on it too. So that's supposed to have cross veins though, brown like ridges and cross veins. And these just, I just don't see the cross veining in them. Luke? Yes? Um, I found that paper, it's by, by Bart Buke from 2016. It says, setting the record straight on North American cantharellus. Oh yeah, yeah, I know that, that one. That should be the go-to reference, you know, uh, you know, it's an early paper and probably more speeches have been described, you know, following that paper, but I think it should be the one that people should be looking at because it lists at least, you know, all the new species that have been described up to that point, which mm -hmm. is, you know, fairly recent. And I, I can post the, uh, the link to that paper um, in the chat. Um, you just go, it's, um, it's on uh, ResearchGate and you can download the PDF from there. So I'm gonna do it now. Look. 
said that he's Velutinus. Velutinus? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. He, he wrote it on the chat. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. You got your name. <laughs> Wait a minute, let's say. So there's my spores. Oh, there's another picture I will tell. Yeah, three chanterelles within like 50 feet of each other. And I always find these, uh, well, these I found middle of uh, beginning of July. But sometimes I'll find these as soon as uh, like, like the end of uh, June. So five by eight and a quarter. Hmm. My spores are a little bit smaller than the, what the besets are calling for volutinous, but that does look pretty good. I'm gonna look into that more. Thanks, John. Okay, those are the two that I have. I just saw Dave Wasileski come in. Are you there yet, Dave? Yeah, I had another Zoom meeting <laughs> regarding um, union um, activities on my job. <laughs> So I'm here now for something a little Much less provocative, let's say. So, <laughs> oh, uh, you want to do yours? Yeah, sure. We can do do mine. Sure. We've been talking. We've been talking all night about the uh, the difficulty in getting to names on a lot of these uh, chanterelle species and how a lot of things are being split up. So. Yeah, especially the form the chanterelles formerly known as sibarios. Yeah. Yeah, there's I don't know I don't know them yet, so um, I, I I should learn those really. There's like I think two or three that I find around here, that you know for years and years and years I called them Sabarius, but I but I I I figured people would would probably have some of those to share, so I tried to you know contribute something different. So here's an interesting one, Appalachiensis. It's a fairly uncommon. Um, species of cantharellus. So I find it sometimes at Ricketts Glen. Ricketts Glen is really quite a quite an area. Um, old growth hardwood mixed with hemlocks and some pines, and find all kind of mushrooms there. And, and this is a, I believe it's still in cantharellus. So um, cantharellus appalachiensis. It's kind of yellowish, sometimes a little paler than this. And then I've got another one here that I paired up with this one that I think is a younger version of the same species, but it really looks quite a bit different. And I looked on Mushroom Observer and I see John Plischke has a fair number of um, uh, posts of things that look like this. And he just says cantharellus and nobody has really proposed a species name, but I, I think these are probably the same thing. Appalachiensis, they're just a lot younger. There's no veins in between the gills. Um, and the gills are very, very, well, the hymenium, I should say, is very, very gill-like because I guess we're not supposed to call these things gills on species of Cantharellus. Um, but I think that's probably the same species as what I just showed, but there might be some other thing that's just undocumented. I don't know. Um, if I find some more of these, I'll, I'll preserve. I may have some of these preserved someplace. I haven't found them in a few years. Um, another thing is these, the next one's going to be these cin cinnabar chanterelles, which for years and years and years and years, they were cantharella cinnabarina, or is it cinnabarina? So, uh, I, I never get this ending in a oh it's penis <laughs> yeah i never get that so okay i don't know how to tell all the female ones from the male ones okay basically that's what it comes down to in terms of this um latin stuff but um there's a patch of these near an apple tree there's some shagbark hickory trees nearby it's probably the hickory trees that are that these are associated with uh they come up every year on my property sometimes i get a fair number of them, and sometimes there's only a few. It depends, of course, on the rain. But for years and years and years, this was Cantharellus cinnabarinus. But then in the south central part of North America, 
um, Cantharell's Tex, I think it's Texensis or Texasensis or something like that. But now there's another name and this new name uh, apparently applies to um, cinnabar chanterelles that, that grow in the Midwest and, and presumably also in, in the Northeast or the Mid-Atlantic. I think I put the name here in somewhere. Oh, I put it in the email, I believe. I didn't post the name because I'm still going to call these cinnabarinas and still, until I have some really good reason to do otherwise. Um, but yeah. John Klitschke tells me that, that, that the research on Cantharellus and Craterellus that, that was done, I guess it was probably about eight years ago, um, has identified a cryptic species um, that, that one may expect to find you know, in, in our region. So, so that, that's the main reason why I posted that. This one, Coralinus. Coral, Coralinus, right. Yeah, there you go. Coralinus. That's the new name. This is an so observation of John's on, on Mushroom Observer. Yeah, he's, he's got, he's, oh, there you go. Yeah. So is this the same thing I find in my yard? Well, I don't really know. You know, maybe it isn't, maybe it isn't. I should probably try to save a few of these and, you know, but I've got so much stuff saved, right? I mean, if I were to submit everything that I have saved for, for DNA, you know, I'd, I'd have to, you know, probably work another five years before I retire. So, you know, I'm not going to do that. But, so, uh, jo so John Plushke putting in the uh, chat. He's saying Coralinus is probably more common. <laughs> That's what he said. Yes. That's what he told me. Mm -hmm. Now I have in the Bassett's book, their, their newest Carolina book, they're saying you can only tell it microscopically or genetically, tell the difference. Yeah, they don't... okay, so there's a way microscopic, oh, I think there might be a spore size difference or something. Yeah, um, but they don't, they, don't, they don't say what it is though. They don't say what it is. Well, I can find out what that is. And you know, hopefully I'll find some next summer and maybe subject them to a little bit of microscopy and you know, maybe I can make a little headway on deciding what kind of cinnabar chanterelles grow in my yard, you know? So uh, I'll, I'll keep that in mind. There's always some new challenge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, it's part of the fun, really. Yeah, so. Ah, here's a good one. I didn't know what this was at first. Found it in the Laurel Highlands. Um, so there's somebody I know out there in the Southwest PA and the sort of the leading edge of the Laurel Highlands. Um, so sort of with the Southwest aspect. So they get, they get all the rain that, you know, the summer rains that, that come up from the Southwest and make thunderstorms. And boy, what, what a great place to look for mushrooms. And so I found this thing, you know, a few of these, they look kind of like black trumpets, but they have a really well-developed hymenium and I posted some sort of name and then I was told it was wrong. And I, you know, and I checked it out and it looked like the other, I think it was maybe, um, maybe Herbert Baker, I think proposed some other name, Phenosis or whatever it is. And it looks pretty good, but I don't find these things around here. I've, I, I've only found them. This, I think I may have found them another time, but I'm not sure if I think it was someplace else than here. Dave, so those are kind of interesting, yes. What was the habitat for this one? Mixed woods. There may there was some hemlock present though. I, I I'm pretty sure I remember finding these because when you find something really unusual, it kind of sticks with you in your in my memory at least, you know, for me. This was a long time ago, I don't know, 2010 or something. Um but yeah, it was mixed woods. There's a lot of, of really nice forest in, in these Laurel Highlands. A lot of places haven't been locked for a lot, at least a long time. There's a lot of old trees. With I beach. think there was hemlock there amongst the hardwoods. Beach? Maybe. Oh. I don't remember. I don't think I... There, I found so many mushrooms <laughs> on, on this these couple of two, three days I spent in the Laurel Highlands. It was just really overwhelming, to be honest. 
um, you know, I took a lot of pictures and I wrote down scant details, um, but I didn't document things in great detail because there's just so much stuff. Um, but it's, you know, it's an interesting one. So I just thought I'd share that one. And it, it just goes to, it's another example of like, you know, there's some things out there that you don't see very often. Mm. Funnel chanterelle, winter chanterelle, trumpet chanterelle, all kind of names for craterellus tubiaformis. I think there might be a new genus for this one. I'm not sure, neo craterellus or something. Or, or pseudo craterellus. Pseudo craterellus. Oh no, wait, pseudo craterellus is something different. No, I, I know about that. You know what? I think these are still craterellus. You know what it is? <laughs> There's a thing out west that they call craterellus tubeiformis, and I think that one is something different. So that they find in like California and Oregon. These I can tell you very specifically I find with hemlock. Wet mossy areas with hemlock. Um, late in the season, October, maybe into November. Yeah, they're a decent edible. They're, there's not a lot to them. You know, they're not real, um, the, the flesh is, uh, is not all that dense. Um, but, you know, they taste okay. They're good edible. They're fun to find. There's not a whole lot else to find, usually, in terms of edibles. When, when these come out, they look really cool. You know, they're just really nice-looking mushrooms. So, But then there's another one. The next one you can show is like a summer version of um, this Craterellus tubeiformis, and this is going to be Craterellus um, ignicolor. And these look quite a bit alike. And, and in fact, this Craterellus ignicolor, when, when they get a little older, they fade a little bit, and the hymenium becomes a little bit more purple. And then they look an awful lot like tubeiformis. But ignicolor, is a reference to the um, yellow color. So that sometimes these are called the flame colored chanterelle. And you know, another thing, I think a lot of the field guides say edibility unknown, but I've eaten these, you know, they're nothing special. Uh, Tubiaformis is probably a little bit better. These are kind of small. Dave? Yes. I noticed that in these species, the, they are more concolorous. In the other one, the tubiformis is like three different colors. You can yeah, see there's the contrast. Yeah, I agree with that. The tubiformis uh, tends, um, the hymenium tends to be kind of purple. The cap tends to be kind of tan, brownish tan, and the stipe tends to be kind of yellow. So it's it's like a tricolor. Mm -hmm. um, but when when these get a little older, though, the colors change a little bit, and they and they look a little bit more like tubiaformis. Uh, but I chose this uh, observation because I thought the pictures were pretty good. And, so, and if anything, this picture emphasizes the difference, which, which is what you're pointing out, Marisol. Mm -hmm. So in the Vicette's book, there are, there are mushrooms in Northeastern North America. They also point out to help identify this one is on the, uh, how do they put it? tiny erect fibrous scales, especially along the margins. Oh, okay. So, so oh, see, yeah. uh, see the scales? You can see them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. On I, the one I, upside down in the left, you can see them, yep. Yeah, yeah well, I, did, yeah, you know, no, I didn't no, even know point. that. <laughs> but, um, but this is more or less, a, I believe, I think this is more apt to fruit in hardwood areas, but you know what? I don't, I, I don't really know, honestly. Look, hmm? look at the one on the right. The little one um, there, uh -huh, uh -huh. they really oh um, up there in the upper they, right hand corner. Yeah, look at uh -huh. that. You can really see it. Very good. Thank you. Ooh, that's and, a good point. and you know what? And there are probably a few undocumented species or at least things that maybe this thing fades and it looks different and people think it might be something else. But if you go like in an old manual like Phillips um, mushrooms of um, uh, North America, um, he's got a few other names that he uses for these types of trumpet chanterelles that are really 
um, representing genus Craterellus, and he may have actually called them Cantharellus because that was quite a while ago. That book came out, you know, 1985 or something like that. Um, but I just want to point out there might be some things out there that are not well understood that are, you know, that are in this same sort of group. Um, Dave, but that uh, there is were, a real Cantharellus. The, um, the one that, that I showed earlier that maybe looked a little like the one you just showed and I thought might be Lutessens. I'll have to go back and is that a, a valid name still or is or is that changed into something else? Sure. Oh, you know what? I don't know. I, have I haven't to... kept up with this latest stuff on, on the chanterelles, to be honest. But I think Tubiaformis is still a good name. Yeah. In the East, at least. Yeah. And I think Ignicolor is still a good name. But this other one, Lutessens, I don't, I'm, I don't know, honestly. Don't... There's another species name that Phillips has that started with X. Oh, yeah. They look different than yours, don't they? Oh, I know what you're talking about. Uh... Yeah, this looks different. Xanthopus. Xanthopus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Xanthopus. So this is what's being called lutescence right here. Uh, that's what, what I guessed. We're, we're, we're not really sure. Well, well, that might be, you know, I don't know. <laughs> um, so we were looking at these down here. I mean, Ignicolor might occur with, with a very ill-defined hymenium. I'm not really sure. The color is certainly similar um but some of them seen here though have a hymenium that really is, does not have much structure at all like this one that's coming in yeah that was very flat looking yeah yeah so um are these just you know a morphological variation of ignicolor are they a different species i don't know that, this is kind of an interesting group these these cred these yellow Craterellas. Um, so I'm not sure how much is understood. There's probably more understood about them than, than I than I know because I haven't read all all the research and about these. They're interesting though. They're they're an interesting. These were also uh, near Hemlock, like the. Uh -huh. that, that what what time of year? Uh, well, it was in upstate New York and in uh, September. Yeah, that would be a little early for to. Well, they don't look like to be a formus, really. So that's mainly late summer mushroom. Interesting, though. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't know what to call these, really. Cra I would call them craterellus. Put them up on Mushroom Observer and call them craterellus and see if, you know, or, or or put the crater else lutescence. The only thing is, though, this is a name that a lot of people don't really probably don't understand really well. So it might turn out to be that nobody really feels confident in disagreeing with you. So, so um, I, this is an old uh, observation not collected this summer. Is it? Can you still do that? Can you put up an old observation on? Mushroom yeah, just observer? date it. Just properly oh, okay. date it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, you can. You can. People put stuff up they found twelve years ago. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you just you just give the date of the collection. Uh, okay. Good. Good to know. Mm -hmm. Right, uh, Penny. Let's look at um. You had that one too. This is the one that you emailed me. This is another black trumpet, I guess, but uh, yeah, there's not much to go on from these pictures, though. To be honest, it's well, not not very it's, uh, in focus, but you can see that I th I think it's got a smoother uh, gill uh, uh, hymenium. Well, I would I would notice two things about this this picture. First of all, it appears to be growing in a coniferous setting. There looks like there's a lot of um, uh, pine needles all around. Yeah. Um, and, the, and the hymenium appears to be whitish, and I don't see any kind of salmon or yellowish on it. So I'm guessing these are white spored. Now, if you look in the field guides, the field guides will tell you 
that in the western areas of North America, the white spored Craterellus cornucopoides is, is found. And in the eastern parts of North America, east of the Rockies, I imagine that means, um, Craterellus felix is found, and that's the orange spored one. But I have found both orange spored and white spored black trumpets. And the white spored black trumpets I have found, as, at least as, as far as I can remember, were all found in coniferous settings. So I think there might be some sort of undocumented white spored craterellus that grows in Eastern North America in coniferous settings. Uh, but I don't know, maybe that, maybe that type of, of trumpet has been studied and named, I, I don't know. But I put these things up on Mushroom Observer and nobody, nobody suggests a species name. So, so I don't know. But I, this might very well be the same thing. And somebody once told me that uh, to look for black trumpets, walk on the woods and look for a hole in the ground. And that's what these remind me of. Yeah, I, I find both, well, both kinds of black trumpets, um, as far as I know, two kinds, right? In, you know, open areas along trails, places where there's where there's a little depression, maybe, maybe that's because the water collects. I don't when it rains. I don't. I don't really know. Um, but the orange spored ones are. I have always found in hardwood areas and the white spored ones in conifer areas. So that's the, that's the correlation that I have noticed. Cool. All right. Thanks, Penny. I had one more that I wanted to look at since uh, I thought I caught an apple in Chan apple of chinensis. But after looking at those other two just a minute ago, I would like a second opinion on it. Well, that one that I showed that had the really pale, well-developed gill-like hymenium, I, I posted it as that I, that I really think it's Appalachiensis, but basically because I have no better name to apply, it might be some other thing. That's I mean, what we name. call that? Oh, that's really yellow. Oh boy. Wow. I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd call that Appalachiensis. Appalachiensis is sort of a much more drab colored sort of thing. Appalachiensis is more brownish on the top. Yeah. Brownish. Yeah. It's, it's more drab. Yeah. Yeah. That's really kind of. That's way too really, yellow. Yeah. Way too yellow. Yeah. That's what I would say. Okay, it's good to know. Yeah, was this by a little? Was this by like a, on a stream bank or something? Or no, just out in the middle of the woods, up in Lock Haven. I was oh. out. Me and Bear, oh, me, me and, was me and, it, you got this on during Nymph? Yeah, but it wasn't an official. It was after Nymph. Me and Barry were out afterwards, and oh. he, he, he was showing me where he goes turkey hunting. This is what we oh were yeah, he showed me some of his spots too. See, some there were some spots we really didn't know how to get a bus into. I uh, see. Yeah, you wouldn't be able to get a bus up where we're at. We yeah, had, yeah, that, that looks like really good there. spots. Yeah. See, I'm looking at Walt Sturgeon's book, his Appalachian Mountains. That's, that's where I named this out of. And his, he has Appalachian, Apple, I can't say it, Appalachiensis in there. And his is bright yellow. Huh, I'll look. I'll look. Yeah. I'll, I, I mean, it's got a little brownish tone to it, bright yellow and a, a really white stipe. Huh. Oh, look. Yeah, look at yeah, look in I, there. And... That doesn't match my concept of that Pelagiensis. You know, maybe my concept is too narrow. Yeah, I mean, you're always learning things. You know, it comes with the territory. Okay, so. So. All right, let me stop sharing.
I've been watching the chat. I haven't seen anybody else add anything that they wanted to share, except for Kay, maybe, if you wanted to come back, Kay. Uh, look. Yes? If I manage to share to share my screen, I have a, um, a chantelle that is really fat and is like uh, the Cinnabarinus color. Okay, yeah, it, sure. Um, go ahead with you were, the person you were thinking. Um, okay, if you wanted to try sharing. And then Jeannie asked something about um, the name pig's ears. And I think it was when we were talking about uh, the polys, polyozorellus. I think that's what we were talking about. Anybody know that name pig's ears? I don't really know what that is. Yeah, it used yes, to be Gumphus Cobatus. Or some, I'm sorry, go ahead. Gumphus Cobatus. Gumphus, okay. Right. Okay. I'm so Jeannie, sure. if you're listening, Gumphus uh, it's kind of a beigey. Yeah, we looked thing. we looked at a few pictures of them in the beginning as lookalikes. So that's what people call pig's ears. So do you, Susan, do you find that in the Adirondacks? I know it grows here and I've seen it exactly once and I didn't collect it, but I, I know where the girl generally found it. I it was a it was very close to me here. But I've been looking for the last, you know, 12 years and have only seen it one time when this girl brought this in. I thought, holy crow, because it's actually supposed to be a dyer, uh, but I, I, I've never found enough of it. When I was out in the uh, Pacific Northwest, oh gosh, I don't know, 2008, I think it was, there was tons of it everywhere. Uh, and that, I think, was in Northern California, Mendocino area. But I've n I know it grows here, and I've only seen it the once. I'm pretty sure it's Gumphus clavatus. Yeah, I think that's right, Gumphus. At least Gumphus. They may have changed something, you know. You never oh, know. Maybe it's not even in Gumphus, but. I, th I think it might still be. Because I've seen it on Mushroom Observer. It's it. It's mainly collected out west, as you're as you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. But it does grow here. That's what the field guides say. You know that it's it's got a pretty it's wide yeah. Mm -hmm. But K go. Is this K's now? Is this K's? Yeah. Yeah. Pretty Are you muted, K? Yeah, I think Unmute. you're muted. Unmute. Okay. There you go. <laughs> can you see it? Can you see that? You sure can. The, yeah, I can the see Cinebrinus, it. The weird thing was that it's they're pretty large, I thought, for the the reddish ones. I don't know. It, it's from um, as you can see, it's from 18, September of 2018. So uh, quite a while ago. Oh, I know where this was. There's this great place called Ice Pond up in um, upstate a little bit, New York, where they used to take ice from. I don't know. It was a really interesting area. And somehow these were from there. But uh, Rainy period leading up to your finding them? Well, September, there were a lot of things. I found a fistula that day, like a, a beefsteak. There were all kinds of interesting things. It was a botany walk we were on, and I was looking at mushrooms. <laughs> how, how large were these? You said they're a little large. Well, there's you can some... see the leaves. So they're pretty large. Okay. Larger than what I'm used to for Cinnabarinus. I don't know. Well, I, I think all... Cantharella species grow very slowly and can grow larger than expected when you have frequent frequent rainfall during their growth cycle. I, mm. Cantharella species seem to be able to keep growing for like mm. two, three weeks. So mm. sometimes they get, the, I have found fairly large cinnabar shants not very often, but <laughs> and, when, uh, when, when John Plushke just John Plushke put in the uh, chat that he's seen them occasionally up to four inches across. Woo, cinnabars! Wow. No, he said pink, the pink chanterelles. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Found them in Stokes and and uh, Titertown, and they were huge. 
even with this parasite, the white ah. gild, yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> I'm tired of February. <laughs> <laughs> You're not alone, Kate. <laughs> Usually I've been to California or Arizona or somewhere where it's like there's other stuff. No, not this year. <laughs> All right, cool. You have anything else here, Kay? No, that, that was it. I, I only had a few things and I was like, where were all those beautiful? But I don't know where they are. Sorry. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you. <laughs> Did you want to try to go? Marisol, I did want to. I wanted to circle back while you do your thing, Marisol. Um, John Plischke mentioned a name. Um, he said something looked like uh, C. Flavo Lateri, Flavo Lateratius. I'm wondering, was he referring to the uh, to Liz's Lateratius? Ask him. Did anybody catch that? Um, the 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 smooth chantrell. It's more common than the smooth one around here. Oh, okay. So the name Flavo Lateradius is the more common smooth chanterelle. Yes. Cool. Thank so you. The I've seen back from the north from northern areas, that tends to be the more common one of the two. Uh, I can't tell apart without DNA. Okay. I have pictures of them on INAT. John, that's more common out where you are. That's more common in our part of the world too. Mm, like this, this um, going across the middle of the United States that way, it seems to be. Okay. Because we don't have a lot of DNA tests, but that's what, whenever I'm looking at DNA results, that's the more common. And you put something about venosis being a BC? British Columbia. Okay, but what do we have here then? Could be it, might not be. But the one that people are comparing it to, that's a North American name. Okay. And the other name, the other name is European, the um, Cinerus. Okay, so we're more likely to be the venosis then. Yeah, if we, if we think that our West Coast mushrooms are the same as East Coast, and we're finding out, you know, they're not really, at least a lot of times. So who knows? So, so Lateridius is a, a European name? I thought that was strictly a North American name. The venosis and the Cinerus. Yeah, we, we, jump, we jump to a different one. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, I lost. Lost the screen for a while. Oh, the Cinnabarinas. Oh, okay. Look. Yes. Can you see my photo? Yeah. Oh, so um, I found two kinds of uh, what we call Chanterelle Cinnabarinus. And this one calls my attention because it was so fat and it was all clumped. And the one in the right. And I did um, microscopic work on both, and they seem on the regular than everybody showed before. The ones that the people show with the very thin stem, and apparently they seem close microscopically, but I wouldn't know about the DNA. But it, it, it's always in one spot, these mm. chunky ones. I, I just wanted to show you that that's a little weird. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks like there's this the one on the right. It looks like there's like three or four of them, like all just they like are, they, they are all clustered, mm -hmm. all tied up. I found the cinnabrinus clustered, but not with that thick a stem. That looks different. You're right. Yeah, I did the micro with because it, I didn't think it was the same. But I don't know. Maybe the DNA will say it, but yeah, it's always grows in the same spot. The, the fat ones, yeah. Everywhere else is still the thin ones that we know, the more common ones. Oh. Do I have a chance to show one more, maybe? Yeah, sure. Okay, let's see if I can do it. Uh, about, the, about the Cinnabarinas, uh, two years ago, I think it is, um, we were finding that Entoloma on, on that, um, on that chanterelle everywhere, uh, everywhere. And then this that year, nothing. I mean, it, it was just like that one year. Did you remember that? We found it at uh, Tita Town with the little, the little um, entoloma on it, the parasite. Mm -hmm. 
And I think it, that's kind of, it's interesting because sometimes some years you get that sort of thing and then you know, you never hear of it again. Yeah, we should dig up that picture. Marisol, you have a picture of that, don't you? That Antiluma parasiticus, I think it's I called. I do, I do. But I wouldn't be able to find it right now. It's too tricky. Too tricky. <laughs> Isn't it on INAT? <laughs> uh, no. no. Ah, it was with the, with the paras parasitic. It's, it was in Wawayanda. Let me try to find it. I, I have one of those. Oh, you do? Okay. okay. Um, on Mushroom Observer, but it's not on a chanterelle. It's on a, a thalaphora. Mm. Or thalaphora. <laughs> not sure how to say it. Yeah, they're, it's amazing that those things are entolomas. They're just these little stockless things that attach to other, other mushrooms. They have gills. And yeah, I've seen them on, um, I've seen photographs of them on Tremides too, Tremides Versicolor. Oh, okay. Yeah, and they have the angular spores and all that. But... Oh, I, I have a photo of the scene, the one I call Cinereus, with few uh, Cinabarinos right there. Oh, yeah. So these ones are like hollow. Yeah. <laughs> you mean like a hole in the cap going mm -hmm. down into the stalk? Uh huh. Yeah, that's a craterellus feature. See, the, aren't they, this was the one they call craterellus cinereus or vinosus? One right. or the other, I don't know. You can see the hole here. And it, yeah, I can, yeah. Actually, I, I don't think hollow. I see the right screen now. You don't see it? The one's oh. on the right. On the right. Oh, 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 on the right there. Oh, it's just they're kind of small. It's hard to see details. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. What, the photos is small? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, my. Yeah, half of my screen is like these thumbnails or something. Oh, jeez. You should just blow up the photo such that it takes the entire screen. Wait, you can't see the whole screen? Well, we can see the whole screen, but it shows multiple objects. Oh, gee. Yeah, the, the, the mushrooms under consideration are occupying only about 40% of the screen. OK, I see. Screen. Let me, now? Yep. Nope. Nope, nothing's changing. Nope. No, nothing changes. Oh, Click hey. on the picture such that it occupies the entire screen. See, OK, wait one second. No? Nope. No look. Ah, wait. Okay, fine. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me see one more. Uh, no. No. No, I don't know how to do it. Uh, you seem to be stuck in this view setting. See, oh no. Okay, sorry. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> okay, thanks, Marisol. Sure. All right, so it's 8.48 now. So does anybody else have, want to take a minute before we uh, wrap it up and share any photographs or just any other observations in general? Can I say a quick photo? Sure. Please. Okay, share. Whoop. Oh, I lost my screen. Share screen. I see you. <laughs> there we go. Is that on there? Let me see. Can you look at my one called John? Is it on oh, there? Oh, my. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> You've been busy, John. Crazy. Is it showing well, up? Do you set up a stand on the side of the road and sell those? Or what do you do? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And there's another one. <laughs> oh, I'm so jealous. What, what, do you, what do you do with them, John? The what? What do you do with them? Just so many. Uh... Usually I feed them to people. Okay, I, f I figured they have to go in somebody's mouth, not just yours. <laughs> you, see that. you cannot possibly, you know, eat crates of these things, can you? <laughs> like when was them. this, John? How long ago? Mm, the year before last. Oh. So you pickle them? Pickling is a good idea. I haven't done that yet. Pickle them, freeze them. Yeah, I, I, I 
fry them a little, saute them a little bit and freeze them. They keep really well. That's what I've been doing, but they lose something. They're not the same as when you get them fresh, but it's nice. I have some in the freezer now and I pull them out and make soup in the winter time. It's nice. Well, they're they're good in stuffing. Somebody <laughs> mentioned putting them in vodka that that is Yeah, a good you can thing. do that. You dry them out first and put them in vodka. I use a couple of fresh ones also if you keep it submerged. Oh. Yeah, I remember that. Remember that a couple of years ago at Neff when the three foragers when they did the mycophagy, they had a vodka that was infused with black trumpets. I was getting passed around there. That's so cool. Yeah, John Wheeler had some. It was actually, you know, he just gave us a little bit, but it was good. I was surprised how uh, it, it absorbed the flavor. It's the fragrance, you know. It's it's all about the fragrance with trumpets. It's great. Yeah. I agree. That's why when I when I cook um, like chanterelles and or trumpets with that fragrance, I usually go really easy with any of the garlics and the onions and stuff like that. Because I usually like a lot of garlic and onions in my mushrooms, but I find chanterelles and trumpets are better off without that stuff because they're so fruity and I feel like the garlic just overwhelms it immediately. Yep, I agree. No garlic with my chanterelles and trumpets, but onions are okay. Yeah, onions, yeah. Yeah, you're right, onions, but you know, garlic you know what's definitely. Re really, really good. And I do it with either frozen or fresh chanterelles. Um, pizza with chanterelles and onions. Oh, it's really, really good. <laughs> with a red sauce? Like pizza with a red sauce? Just a regular red and white pizza. Nice. With, um, ch with chanterelles and onions. Yeah, and no garlic. Yeah, no garlic with chanterelles. It, it, it sort of cancels out their flavor, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when you look in like a lot of the old French recipes, because the French love their chanterelles. They're like, the French are like gaga over chanterelles. Um, when you look in a lot of those old French recipes, they're always putting things like like the fruit brandies with it, um, apricot brandy in, their, in the chanterelles. You know, all those things that like complement that aromatic floral flavors. I do a, a cream sauce over like a chicken breast with a- Yeah, me too. Yeah, the, cream you know, sauce with chanterelles yeah, and chicken. A little bit of yep. that apricot brandy. And it, even the frozen ones come back when you use that little bit of apricot brandy. Yeah, I put, uh, and when I put them in chicken stuffing, I put in uh, some diced uh, dried apricots. Mm, that's a good idea. Mm, yeah. Diced apricot. That sounds awesome. Well, this is perfect. This is a perfect segue to introduce next week's Taxonomy Tuesday. So next week, which is uh, February 16th, in honor of our annual mycophagy that we can't do this year. So every year, right around this, uh, this time in February, the club normally has a big uh, mushroom cooking event or it's a members only event. And we just get loads and loads of mushrooms, um, both wild and cultivated mushrooms. And we just cook all these dishes up and uh, eat them. Obviously we can't do that right now. Um, so next week uh, we scheduled the best of edibles and I was gonna try to make it a little bit lighter. You know, I think maybe we just all come with like our, you know, three to five observations of our favorite edibles and we can talk about the mushrooms. So let's talk about eating them too, you know? How's that sound? Great. Great. Awesome. Fantastic. Sure. Sounds good. Delicious. Awesome. Good. All right. Anybody have anything else they want to go over tonight? Nope. Or are we calling it a night? See. Okay, cool. Then okay. I will see everyone next week with your best of your edibles. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Luke. Thank good you. Night. Good night. Good night. Good night.